First, we start with Stephanie. She is an assistant professor of world Christianity at Valparaiso in Indiana. Her research and her dissertation has been on Father Vincent Lab, Le Mian. The title of her speak today is Father Vincent Lab, Le Mian, conceiving the Chinese Church as indigenous and national. Jin Lu, she is a professor of French at uh, Purdue University. She is well known for having co-authored a book with Father Benoit Bermandet, Dancing on the Bridge, Intercultural Encounter and Dialogue. Good morning, everybody. My hope today is to discuss some of the bridge efforts of this famous, at times controversial, priest and patriot for China, Father Vincent Leb, Le Mingyuan. In particular, I want to discuss how he conceived of the Chinese church as itself a site for bridge building. Uh, despite the title of our conference, I don't think that he saw the dialogue as being necessarily between Catholicism as an ism and Chinese civilization, um, though he was committed in, in many ways to both. Um, I think he saw the goal in a very ecclesiological frame. And so that's something I hope to highlight today. Um, so first, a few words of basic biography on the cultures he bridged in his own life. First of all, Belgium and China. So for those of you who don't know his life, he was, on the one hand, born in Belgium in 1877, grew up as a French-speaking Catholic, committed himself to the Paris-based Lazarists. Um, and although he strongly opposed European imperialism in China and eventually left the Lazarus order, he never wholly cut relational ties with friends and family back home, maintaining those networks. On the other hand, China, he threw in his lot with China, gave up his Belgian citizenship to become a Chinese citizen to serve his chosen people. And so he put all his adult energies towards supporting a Chinese church hierarchy. Could you give us a year for reference? Oh, yes. Sorry. He was born in 1877, Thank and you. he's going to die in 1940. So we're talking early 20th century. He spans the end of the Qing uh, dynasty and then into the early years of the Republic. Thank you. Second, uh, Father Lei saw himself bridging between Chinese Catholicism and other Chinese religious and philosophical traditions. So during his early life, he set up some lecture halls, which were intended to provide a space for dialogue between Catholic thought and Chinese thought, um, and to see how their contributions might help Chinese society in the modern era. He wasn't as well studied in the Chinese classics as some of the earlier Jesuit missionaries, but he believed, quote, Confucius teaches a natural morality as adaptable to Catholicism as the morality of Aristotle. So he hoped uh, to draw on the dynamic traditions of Catholic and Chinese thought. Last bridge that I want to flag for you, uh, the bridge between religious and public life. And I think this is really the, the juicy and most interesting one for us to talk about today. He hoped to hold at bay the, any secularizing tendency to view religion as apart from, or God forbid, at odds with the good of society because he believed that the church should be a force within and for the good of the whole. So in his later life, he rallied Chinese Catholics, especially to the war effort against Japan, believing that Catholics shouldn't be sitting out the war in any way, but should be active as religious people, motivated by faith uh, to seek national well-being. For instance, in the midst of the Sino-Japanese War, in defending his work with the Chinese army, he told his brother, I hope tomorrow when we have set to building new China, we shall be in the front line, shoulder to shoulder, with the working people, with the peasants. So he hoped for solidarity to, to traverse and to reinforce bridges between church and society. Um, so I want to talk a bit about patriotism because Lei was a self-described patriot for China who um, wanted the good of the the country. And I think this was operative both in his early life's work. He's most famous for promoting the cause of Chinese bishops, indigenous native Chinese bishops for the church in China, but also in his later work in the war effort against Japan. Okay. 
But I want to also note that his patriotism actually uh, changed, like the way that was expressed changed. And so in the early days, he emphasized patriotism as inappropriate in mission, having in mind the presence of French civil officials in China. B, later on, emphasizing that the church needs national reform. And then finally, in the latter part of his life, stressing how the national Catholic church must serve the nation. So let me just demonstrate that really quick. Three uh, snapshots in time. In 1902, the 25-year-old Father Lei was beginning his ministry under the waning power of the Qing Empire, and he saw the extent to which French civil interests were permeating the seminary in Beijing, and he was troubled by the way that the gospel seemed to be packaged in French culture. And so he told his brother, above all, never be one of those patriotic missionaries, as there are so many who want, I dare say it, to plant the flag with the cross often before the cross, and sometimes without the cross, and always to the detriment of the cross. So here you see him calling for mission to transcend state politics. In his view, the missionary's job was to plant the cross and not to confuse it with spreading the gospel, um, not to confuse spreading the gospel with the pursuit of national interests. Okay. Spotlight B. By 1917, the Qing dynasty had fallen, and we are now in the early years of the New Republic. Lei had run into conflicts with the, his local Lazarus leadership and the French civil uh, officials over a conflict known as the Laoshi Kai affair, um, where the French concession was being expanded. And after being demoted and uh, chastised by uh, the local ecclesiastical officials, he concluded that these issues of the church and its political affiliations in China would never be resolved until there was reform on a national level. So he says, the real purpose in my life, more than the particular and immediate good of Tianjin, is the nationalization of the Chinese church. You see him here taking a more national frame. Spotlight three, by 1939, Lei was now 61 years old in what would be the final year of his life. He was a general in the Nationalist Army, and he led an organization for wartime relief work, propaganda, and intelligence gathering at the personal direction of General Chiang Kai-shek. Now here, you've got to keep in mind, he's writing to the Catholics of Japan, who were asking Chinese Catholics to agree to a peace agreement. And he says to his uh, co-religionists of Japan, the enemy nation at the time, no, we're not going to concede to your requests. Because with all our hearts, not only as citizens, but especially as Catholics, we obey our magnanimous leader whose Christian sentiments honor us in front of the whole world, the General Chiang Kai-shek, knowing that by obeying him, we obey God. This is a striking statement where we see how at the end of his life, um, Father Lei has aligned the church not only with national interests, but with the, the ruling leadership which he hoped would defend China strongly against Japanese incursions. And so in his later writings, <laughs> under these exigencies of national defense, the Catholic's religious duties and uh, patriotic duties in his, in his writings seem sometimes merely contiguous. Okay. Now on the one hand, I don't think these shifts are entirely contradictory um, because Lei consistently believed that mission to China must serve the good of the Chinese. That's constant. To resist foreign control, to support domestic rule for him, were two sides of the same coin, Chinese patriotism. But at the same time, it does seem that his view of the proper relationship between church and the political order was in flux. For though in his early life, he was working to disaffiliate the church from state power, in particular that of European nations, in his later life, he took the opposite tack. Uh, seeking opportunities to affiliate with and serve the state. This is something we um, can puzzle over some more. Oh no, I didn't want to do that. Okay, so in thinking more about how were people at the time, how were Catholics, uh, pro-indigenization Catholics, like Father Lei and many of his Chinese friends, how were they thinking about patriotism? One question to consider, was it a virtue and or a tool? And I think we see strains of both. Um, a kind of intrinsic value placed on patriotism and a utilitarian view. In some of his writings, he characterizes it as a nobility, a virtue, and other times 
as a useful tool. Um, some of his writings where this comes out most clearly is in a letter to the Bishop of Ningbo where he had been relocated. And the bishop had published some instructions warning them against the dangers of, quote, noisy patriotism. So Father Lay wrote a response trying to defend patriotism and at least a, an openness towards it. And he makes the case that patriotism has played a legitimate role in European, um, the European war efforts, because World War I, right? Um, and he also draws on Christian Democrat ideals of patriotism being itself a fruit of Christianity. So you see that in a quote like this, where he talks about um, the force of patriotism being a nobility, that this is a, a strength for the country, even a Christian nobility. Um, so you see his idealism there. He also would talk about patriotism as an ingredient in missionary method. So when uh, criticized by some of his colleagues for uh, engaging in patriotic conversation, he, he said, well, to, to, to grow the church, to engage people's hopes and aspirations without attention to their, their uh, patriotism, this would be like to demand that a master cook make a tart as sugary as the first, but without using sugar, as in the first time. So in metaphors like that, you see he thinks it's an essential ingredient. Okay. Um, Father Lay also saw patriotism as a, as a potentially you know, disruptive force. He acknowledged that. But he urged the bishop to consider it's not by ignoring patriotism among our Chinese Catholics that we will suppress it. It is not by trying to minimize it that we will prevent it from crossing certain borders. And that undergirds his case for why, in the 20s, he hopes the, the church will get Chinese bishops. He says, this is why we need a Chinese leader in the difficult matter of patriotism. Surely the first step for the church would be to have a Chinese leader who can most successfully wield patriotism as a legitimate good. They alone could have in hand, God helping, the controls, the pistons of the machine. If he, a Chinese bishop, cannot prevent all evil and error, at least he can, with the help of God, according to his desired directions, be a regulator of this force, to keep it in the rail and direct it towards the church. Okay. Um, sorry, it's not working now. There we go. Okay. So Father Lei had much the same sensibility as other Catholics at the time, like Ma Xiangbo, who saw um, the nation as a spiritually infused impulse. Okay, so here we have Ma Xiangbo, who's a famous Catholic senator, um, who said, and, and a former Jesuit, he said, the reason human begins beings can form into nations is due to the spiritual self. Human beings want to form nations as a way of preserving the happiness of the spiritual self. If forming a nation did not guarantee the satisfaction of the spiritual self, but rather this happiness was destroyed by the nation, then where could this desire for nationhood come from? Okay, so this is pretty typical of many of also the Protestant Christians at the time who really saw um, spirit as kind of a, a, a category that encompassed both overtly religious aspirations and potentially patriotic and political ones. And they hoped for a dialogue somewhere in kind of the, the um, rather broad umbrella of what counted as spiritual. Okay. And so Vincent uh, Lay, he says something similar. It seems to me that one can characterize the dominant note of, in this case, Chinese students in Europe he's talking about, their aspirations in one word, patriotism. In this particular speech, Father Lay is defending the patriotism of, of European uh, or Chinese students who'd gone to study in Europe in the 20s. And they were often kind of written off as just, just patriots, right? They're only interested in serving China and not really interested in matters of faith. And he asks his fellow Catholic missionaries in this speech to take a pause back, because he says, well, if in fact we are interested in matters of faith, if that's what we're trying to do as evangelizers, then we actually should not write off the hopes of the people. And this is where the language of aspiration comes in. He says, well, what really are their aspirations? For us missionaries, the question is of extreme gravity. For it is certain that we cannot have an influence on an environment without knowing it. To convert a soul to the truth 
It is necessary before anything else to discover its aspirations, its desires, to tease out the legitimate part and rely on that. So I think um, my understanding of uh, Lei Mingyuan is he was someone who wanted not to get too caught up in kind of civilizational I identities of, okay, well, what is Catholic civilization and what is Chinese civilization? He hoped that there was room on the spiritual plane for seeing people's desires. And he wasn't necessarily affirming that every patriotic desire has a good end, but he thought that if Catholicism, if Catholic faith deals in anything, it's in this realm of aspiration. That's what the church is about. Um, and so missionaries should not be ruling out the hopes that most animated the souls of those they hope to reach. Just a last couple words on the kind of ecclesial nature of his, his vision here. When they were promoting the cause of Chinese bishops, um, Father Lei would see things like, we live in a golden age of church history. And this was his way of saying, like, this is not a special case, right, of like trying to navigate the politics of um, the domestic Chinese state, trying to have Chinese leaders who have to navigate that domestic political situation. This is how it's been in any chapter of church history. Whether you think about Paul writing in the midst of you know, Roman prisons, or you know, Augustine of Canterbury going to convert the Anglo-Saxon king, it's always been political. Um, and so he said, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that uh, the, the church must chart its way in the midst of political conundrums. The other thing he did is he often used or, uh, kind of organic uh, language about the growth of the church. This isn't, I, I, there was another quote I was looking for and this isn't it, but you see him talking about life. Is this, is this church going to live? And he felt that without proper leadership and a proper um, rootedness within the life of the society, the church would not be able to flourish and grow, just like a plant without roots cannot grow. And, an, an animal without a stomach is not going to um, thrive. And so you would say things like, if the Church of China becomes in China what the Church of France is in France, or what the Church of America is in America, right? This, root, this rootedness, this having the, the local resources to grow in an organic way, it will live. But if not, it will remain dead. So in conclusion, um, I think this dialogue between religious and public life, especially between church and society, is where he hoped the, the dialogue about loves, about aspirations, would happen. Um, with neither Catholicism as an ism, as the end, nor the state necessarily as an end, but he hoped those could be dialogue, the people involved in both those bodies could be involved in a common discussion about loves. Um, Excuse me, about laws or about love? Loves. About love. What is it that people <laughs> seek to love? love? What are the aspirations of the soul? That is where he hoped the dialogue between church and society might point. Uh, less to identity and more towards uh, the realm of aspiration and indeed hopes that he felt the human life was about. Thanks very much. So that's Francois Huang and the interesting person that I'm going to talk about today. And um, he was born in China in 1911 and died in France in 1990. Um, he converted to Catholicism while in, living in France. My presentation today will focus on Francois Huang's conversion to Catholicism in France. It is part of a chapter in a book length project entitled Chinese Soul in Global Catholicism. Chinese Catholic intellectuals before Vatican II. Francois Huang did not leave a well-crafted narrative about his conversion experience. The most comprehensive account of his spiritual journey comes from an unpublished interview with Francois, Francois Montfort, a historian and oratorian, conducted on December 17, 1979. In this interview, Transcribed into a document of 38 page pages, Mengfeng proved to be an active and insightful interlocutor who had known Huang for decades and remembered certain statements, private or public, that the latter either had remembered, that either had forgotten or felt the need to clarify, rectify, or supplement. 
The interview reveals the difficulty of reconstructing and interpreting a long process of spiritual transformation. Far from viewing this document as the single most authoritative explanation of Huang's conversion, I examine it in light of the polyphonic texture of his overall writings published or published or archived, as well as the, the accounts from contemporaries who knew him in various circumstances and wrote about his dramatic conversion to Catholicism from a fiercely anti-Christian Marxist youth who associated Christianity with Western imperialism. Huang arrived in Lyon in 1932 at the age of 20 with a scholarship program financed by the indemnity that France had received from the Qing government following the defeat of the Boxer Rebellion by the Eight Nation Alliance in 1901. The Jesuit theologate of the province of Lyon and Paris had returned to Fouquier in 1926 and became a center of effervescent theological explorations after almost half a century in exile following the 1880 French Parliament bill closing all Jesuit schools in France. From Fourvier emerged a theological movement which proposed to return to the church fathers in order to retrieve a mystical theology, drawing upon the lived experiences of the early Christian communities and capable of engaging the modern world. The most prominent among this group of Jesuits were two future cardinals and Vatican II theologians, Henri de Lubac and Jean Daniel. Meanwhile, the creation of the Institut Franco Chinois in 1921 had brought waves of Chinese students to Lyon. This conjunction made Lyon a great point of contact between Catholicism and Chinese culture. Two encounters there would play a decisive role in Huang's life in France. Edouard Duperré and Jean Val. From his early childhood, Edouard Duperré dreamed of becoming a missionary. Duperré is studying in the major seminary of saint diriné of Francheville, where he became the close friends of Gilles Montchanin, his alter ego, to borrow Henri de Libac's term. With Montchanin and Duperré, Libac shared the same view on the relationship between Christianity and non-Christian religions. Like Vincent Lep, Le Mignan, that earlier in this session, we, I think we can, re, re, we can discuss him further in the discussion session. Like Vincent Lep, whom he met in Lyon several times between 1922 and 1926, Tibet wanted to become Chinese as much as possible. More than a complete reversal of the common power structure, since the 19th century, Dubéry intended to adopt a contemplative and intellectual apostolate in the spirit of dialogue with non-Christian cultures and wisdom. At the request of some Chinese Catholic students at the Institut Franco Chinois, Dubéry became their chaplain in 1930. He was in this in the tiny student publication, Bildan de l'Association Catholique Chinoise du Sud-Est de la France that Dribach published his article, Catholicism. Catholicism. Mm, mm, eponymous ways and an early draft of one of his most important works to be completed in 1938. From the 1930s onward, Dribach formed close bond with Mu Shanan and Dupere and became closely acquainted with several Chinese students including Francois Huang and his best friend, Vincent Wu. In fact, Vincent Wu, when he was baptized, he, he chose the name Vincent because of Father Lab. Huang recognized that Dubéry had prepared the ground for his conversion by his extraordinary hospitality and kindness. In his memorial essay upon Huang's death, Irénée Henri Dallemain, a Dominican priest, indicate that Duperin, who died only two weeks before Huang, remained his friend and spiritual guide until the end of his life. When Huang arrived in Lyon, he believed, as many young Chinese of his time did, that the only way to save China was through science. While studying biology at the University of Lyon, he met another pivotal figure who would change his life, Jean Val. 
a student of Henri Bergson and one of the most prominent French philosophers in the 20th century. Born in a secular Jewish family and married to a Catholic woman who raised their children in Catholicism, Val himself refused to be identified with any specific religion. Val taught at the universities of Besançon, Nancy, and Lyon before joining the Faculty of Philosophy at the Sorbonne in 1936. One day, while walking downhill to the University of Lyon from the Institut franco chinois Huang noticed an all bundled up little man on the bridge. It was Jean Val, and the two somehow started to chat. Upon learning that Huang was studying biology, Val invited him to come to his class and give a presentation on logic and scientific methodology. Impressed by his metaphysician mind, Val encouraged him to study philosophy under his direction. Huang followed Wale when the latter became pro a professor at the Sorbonne. After a brief study in Munich, where he studied in phenomenology and finished his bachelor's degree, he came back to Paris and began to work on his doctorate under Wale's direction. A Socratic figure who delighted in paradoxes and refused to take any clear cut position, Wale destroyed all of Huang's previous convictions, Marxism, scientism, positivism, and Hegelianism, and Huang counted him among people who prepared the ground for his conversion. Val cleared the path. Not, no less importantly, Val introduced Huang to France intellectual circles and helped establish his role as the cultural intermediary between China and the West. Jean-Marie Bobert stated that Val was an adopted father for Huang, who had lost his own at a tender age. In the long list of people who play a role in his conversion, Huang also mentioned Vincent Wu, Wu Zhengyang, even though the latter was baptized a few months after him. Li Bak remembered Huang as a Buddhist, his best friend Vincent Wu as a Confucian, and their conversion as having occurred in Liu, one after the other. Even though the actual place of Huang's baptism, based on his baptism record, was in Paris, it is nevertheless true that the long process of Huang's conversion started in Lyon. In 1937, while vacationing in Grenoble, Huang met Vincent Wu in a cafe, and the two got acquainted, exchanged ideas, and became the kind of friends for whom words such as a soulmate or alter ego were created. It was during the war in Lyon that Huang came into contact with many Catholics such as Jean Lacroix, Marc Bidegger, who helped Chinese students. Over a hundred arrived from all over France and Belgium and needed to be hosted. As an increasing number of people he knew were arrested by the Gestapo, Huang left Lyon to hide out in the mountainous area of Haute-Loire in 1942. It was to be himself nearly arrested by the Gestapo who arranged to find the hiding place for him. Huang was then working on a dissertation on the English neo hegelian prophet, philosopher Bernard Zanguet, and re he remained in close contact with the Jesuits in Val le in the haute loire region, especially Gaston Fessard, a great scholar of Hegelianism and a close friend of Henri de Rivas. Mm, Fessard authored the first volume of the journal Carrier du Témoignage Christian, published in November 1941, which openly opposed Nazism and antisemitism in the name of Christian values. Fessier had an absolutely extraordinary library, and Huang borrowed books from him. Huang was then completely cut off from China, not even knowing if his mother was alive, but it was a crucial and fruitful period in his spiritual journey. Madame Hu, a woman who hosted him in a small village in the Old Loire region, was widely credited with Huang's conversion based on different versions of the events. These versions mostly concur, but with slight variations. All likely came from Huang himself. He may have told the story slightly different at the diff various moments of his life, emphasizing different components that his interlocutors may have interpreted variously. Madame Hu was a widow who, 
had lost her husband during the First World War. Their son was a resistance fighter, and their daughter was a school teacher. Huang rented a room from her because her son was away, and he was able to observe how she lived her life. Without naming her, multiple accounts attribute Huang's conversion to Madame Hu. Zhang Lufeu could remember that an old French woman inspired Huang's conversion because he noticed that, quote, she never criticized anyone and showed a great deal of love towards him, end quote which remind him of his own mother. Yihini Henri Dalmay had largely the same recollection in his memorial article. A Christian peasant woman reminded Huang of his own mother, a pious Buddhist. Huang famously dedicated his book, Am Chinois et Christianisme, Chinese Soul and Christianity, to the memory of his mother who, by raising him in Buddhist faith and piety, prepare him to know the light of Christ. Buddhism seemed to be a more hospitable ground for Catholicism than Marxism. Non-Christian religions as preparation to comprehend the gospel was an important argument made by Jesuit theologians such as Vibat and Wang Changzhi in the 1930s, and eventually found its way into consular documents such as Rome and Gentile. François Huang's contribution to the collective volume, Jean Danielou, 1905 to 1974, published after the Cardinal's death, shed some lights on the last months leading to his baptism. At the beginning of 1944, Huang was living in Paris in order to finish his dissertation. He was then closely associated with Danielou, whom he saw almost every week in the home of Marcel Mohé, an unnamed Christian woman who had rendered him value, invaluable service during the war was then gravely ill and asked him to pray for her. Not knowing what to do, he decided to serve mass for Father Cidier in the of the Eglise saint Sivran. On the morning of the September 8, 1944, the Feast of Nativity, Cidier, Father Cidier, who thought Huang must be Catholic, gave him the communion bread, which he took without having the time to think. Afterwards, he was overwhelmed by a sense of sacrilege and ran to Danielou to explain what had happened. Danielou eased his conscience by assuring him, if you have, I quote, if, he have this, if you have this sense feeling of sacrilege, it's because you already believe in God, end of quote. Here, Danielou carried out the role of a spiritual director in the Ignatian tradition by helping Huang discern God's presence in his heart. Huang felt liberated by this assurance. Two days later, Danielu invited Huang and his friend Thierry Léris to join a group of theology students from the Institut Catholique of Paris for pilgrimage to Chartres. It was a powerful ex spiritual experience for Huang. The Christian woman in the essay on Danielu was Madame Hu's daughter. The interview with the Hmong father is the only document I knew that identified her as Madame Hu's daughter and gave her an important role in Huang's conversion. Bobet mentioned that Huang went to the San Sifan church to pray for a young woman he was in love with without specifying her identity. The interview provides basically the same narrative as the essay on Daniel Lu, but specifically credits Madame Hu's daughter with his conversion. Had she not been sick, they probably would have been married. Huang explained that it was by serving mass in order to pray for her that the process of his conversion was set up. This version placed a great emphasis on the practice of religious ritual. Huang then went to another Jesuit father, Yves Hagan, and told him that he had decided to convert. Hagan arranged to have mother Marie de l'Assomption provide his baptism preparation. Marie de l'Assomption became a nun in the society of the helpers of the Holy Souls with the intention of becoming a missionary in China. Serious health problems prevented her from going on mission. Huang's unconventional religious education, which includes works by Paul Claudel, Henri de Libac, and Charles de Guy, lasted from September 14 or 18, 1944 to July 7, 1945. Huang confided that Madame Marie de l'Assomption, she liked me a lot. I like her a lot. For Huang, 
spiritual conversion was inseparable from affective experiences. It took many affective and other ex experiences to arrive at conceiving the reality of God, explained Huang to Mengfa. Affective experiences, love or friendship, connected Huang to all the people who play a role in his conversion and spiritual progress. Together with Zhang Danielu, Marie de l'Assomption was the founder of the Cercle Saint-Jean-Baptiste. The Cercle played a groundbreaking role in moving Christianity beyond its historical ties to the West and promoting dialogue with different cultures in the world. It counted among its collaborators experts in various religions around the world, including Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism. Yves Hagan, Edouard Duperré, and François Wang were involved with the Cercle since its inception and were among its earliest collaborators. And this is Huang's baptism record. It's kind of, I made it as big as possible, so it's, it's still tiny. Huang's life was part of a global history of mass migration and exile that formed a large part, a large Chinese diaspora starting in the 19th century. His conversion and sacerdotal vocation were nurtured and embraced by Catholic leaders in France and in the Chinese diaspora, who advocated for an intellectual and a culture postulated in the footsteps of Mario Ricci. I share here a picture of an article by, uh, by Edouard Duberry, trying to, which try to, try to, argue the point that um, it's very important, the importance of Chinese diaspora in the world and with some statistics. Once lived experience revealed that a conversion is not always a linear process with a sudden and clearly identifiable turning point. Christianity as he encountered it during the interwar and post-war periods in France through a series of spiritual and affective experiences united contemplation with action and provided the synthesis of the Buddhist desire for trans transcendence imparted by his mother and his useful Marxist solidarity with the suffering human beings, brothers and sisters right here in this world. Thank you for your attention. Paul uh, Martin from the Bay Area here. I just like to direct question to uh, mm -hmm. Professor Wong. Um, regarding uh, Vincent Lev, his, what were his understandings about the Chinese aspirations and desires? I mean, what, what was his main understanding? In many of his writings, what he emphasizes is that faith requires a certain kind of stability in order for the church to grow. He was very concerned about the upheaval of the civil, um, the civil strife and the warlord period in the, the 1910s and 20s. So I think one thing he agreed with in the Chinese patriot, patriotic discourses of the day was the need for a strong and stable society. Um, and that was his conviction that the, the, the society needed a certain degree of stability and strength in order for people to be able to grow the church. So he was very practical in that sense, and he saw that desire for communities, for families, for society as a whole to be able to flourish as just a baseline condition for the growth of the church. And he agreed with the patriots who therefore wanted a strong, a strong society. Mm -hmm. Did you under, uh, did he know about Chiang Kai-shek's atrocities against the Chinese people? in Shanghai, for example, or killing of the communists? What did he think about all that? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. In his writings, he actually was coming back from Europe when the Shanghai massacre stuff happens, mm -hmm. and he was aware of it and concerned about the violence. Um, but I do think at that period you see in his writings, he's unsure what's going on in the internal divisions of, of the Nationalist Party, but on the whole, he was hopeful that the rightists would would win. Um, and again, that's because mm. we can take issue with this. He believed that they had a greater chance of unifying the nation. He wanted a unified nation mm. because he thought that would help the church. 
Now, did, did he, does he document an awareness of the atrocities? No. So I'm not entirely sure you know, how much detail he was aware of, because at that time, communications were pretty poor. And he, he's on a boat in the middle of the harbor trying to get yeah. back to Tianjin at the time. Stephanie, my name is Tom McGuire, chair of the board of USCCA. I was kind of interested in your comments on this, that this morning's news, Pope Francis taught in the news report, he talks about the influence of ideology on church and how it can kind of shape our way of thinking in a pattern that is contrary to the teachings of the Catholic Church. And, and I, I sense from what you said that Leb was very much aware of that. I know for me, Leb was an important part of my education, but we never got into this part of it. I and mean, we, we saw him as somebody who was interested in the indigenous church, and that's why he was a champion for us. But I, we never heard about this aspect of patriotism and, and the role that played in his understanding. It would seem to me that it was difficult when we talk about patriotism and the desires people have that are related to that, that that often can shape the way we interpret the gospel. And I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that, if you have something that could enlighten on that. Yes, as both of you are noting, I think um, the latter part of his life, where he gets so deeply embedded in the nationalist army, is, to me at least, really troubling in a way. Um, you know, it's it's not as easy a story to tell as the earlier part of his life where, you know, he's this pro-indigenization, um, you know, kind of hero for the Chinese church. So, I mean, I think two things have to be held in intention. One is the openness, at least the initial openness he wants to maintain, that if patriotism is first of all about love, then that's in the realm of questions of the soul that the church should at least be interested in talking to, engaging with, not writing off in a kind of secularizing or reductive way as simply geopolitical, right? Like we're dealing with people who have hopes and he wanted to maintain that. At the same time, he was aware that there's risks of instrumentalization and that, uh, as you say, ideology then can actually start shaping our understanding of what the, what, what the tradition is saying. Um, and I, I, I should note, at the end of his life, in the last couple of years, when he's leading a, this espionage propaganda group for the Chinese army in Japanese-occupied territories, he's in close contact with uh, General Lee Simu Chiang Kai-shek. But at one point, he writes to the Little Brothers, the Chinese order that he'd founded, that he was concerned about instrumentalization. Was, in fact, Chiang Kai-shek interested in serving the Chinese peasants? Or was this Catholic-focused effort really getting hijacked for the interests of the state. And so he tells one of his brothers that he's actually interested in stepping down from that role, but he didn't, as far as I know. Um, and so my understanding of his biography is that he does continue, and he's still in that role when he, he dies about a year later. But it speaks to the tensions that I don't think he was ignorant of, I don't think he was aware of, I don't think he was unaware of um, the fact that you know, patriotism, so any kind of um, teleological fervor like that can certainly um, override the impulses of faith that he went in with as his primary goal. Does that address it at all? Hey, that's, that's some. Thank you. I'm Sister Maria Gabriel, and I'm from a Franciscan community that was founded in China. And my question is for Stephanie. Um, are there particular experiences of Leb that you can cite that um, led to his change in view about patriotism? Well, on the one hand, I guess I want to say that I don't think his view on patriotism necessarily changed. He saw, again, he, he was of the generation that saw nationality as itself a kind of spiritual impulse. And so mm -hmm. all along, he's sort of for China. He's, he's thrown his lot in with China and is going to resist what he sees as incursions from foreign anybody, whether that's France or Japan. So in that sense, he's consistent. 
I think one of the big turning points in his life is in 1916-17, there's this big conflict over a, a cathedral in Tianjin where he's the, the district director. And I think at that point, he came to see that all the little scuffles he'd been having with local Lazarus leadership over kind of the culture of um, kind of the French civil governors and their role in the local Chinese church, he realizes that that's not going to be solved until there's a national Chinese church. And so I think that's where he, he, he something shifts there when he concludes that the only way some of the cultural tensions will be resolved is by getting a national scope for the indigenous church. And he was also involved not only in the effort to get Chinese bishops then, but also in other nationally bounded organizations like Catholic Action. So there was a, then at that point um, various efforts in the 1910s and then again in the late 20s to found a national level organization, an umbrella organization for all the local Catholic action societies where they're going to lobby on the, the Senate, for instance. So I think he, he really does take on the kind of modern category of the nation state as maybe even more important practically than say the diocese as the kind of ecclesial unit of the church or um, of, you know, necessarily thinking about the church global. He sees that for these geopolitical tensions and cultural tensions to be resolved, they need a national church. And that, I think it's this question of scale, right? That the scale that he, he starts to think on more and more is not Tianjin, the diocese or the district, but rather the nation. Okay. So he's kind of a precursor then to some of the national organizations that then both from the church side and from the state are established in the 1950s where the goal is to get nationally organized. Okay, thank you. I think by listening to Michelle and, and also Professor Jean Liu and also Stephanie's presentation, I, I just learned something very really unique about that you know, Francophone uh, Christian missionary movement in China. There are certain kind of you know, very interesting mystical elements uh, that actually facilitate the missionaries' their own conversion experience uh, and also some of the Chinese intellectual elite, uh, their own conversion as well. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I can actually see, you know, you also have to, uh, you know, um, embrace that, you know, French cultural uh, philosophical package, you know, in order to experience that uh, mystical uh, form of, you know, Catholicism. Uh, so so I, I just find, you know, these two things just, you know, mixed together. And, and I wonder how it is possible to separate the two, actually. Yeah, I want to add a comment to the discussion about religion and culture. And from the theologians that I read, basically Jesus theologians from Anghidulu back to Yang Danielu and uh, of Hansa Huang or the group of Chinese Catholic intellectual I study, I think their view is that um, Christianity needs to be rooted in culture. So you cannot um, um, make Christianity separate from a culture. But that also means that when missionaries go into China from Europe, they should not confuse religion and culture. And you, they need to seek to root Christianity in Chinese culture, because that's where you that's the ground of your work. And so for me, there isn't a, really a, a contradiction that in, in Europe, Christianity is rooted in European culture. And uh, when gospel is spread to China, missionaries or Chinese Catholic or, or Protestants, they need to seek ways to, so that Christianity can be rooted in Chinese culture. And in a way that we define culture not as monolithic or unchanging, but nevertheless, there are circumstances and there, it, there's a soil where you need to plant the seeds. And that's how I understand it. If I should, could add one word. Uh, Father Leb, uh, many times in, in his life, used to use the word Jiuguo to save the country, save the country from foreign imperialism, from the Japanese, from communism and so on, uh, but through Christ. Through Christ. Thank you very much.